Hello, welcome to lesson three. I am excited to get into the word of the Lord with you today. We already talked about in our introduction how we're going to talk about the importance of the process. Lesson two, we went and delved deeper into the text of Genesis 28 where the stone became a pillow and the pillow became a pillar and the pillar became God's house and there was a process that God was initiating in the life of Jacob. And we talk about how he had this dream of angels while he was headed to Mesopotamia. Now, after this moment, he goes to Mesopotamia to dwell with Laban, his mother's brother, his uncle. He goes to dwell in his house. And while there, he gets married, he has kids. And God is blessing everything that Jacob touches. Everything that Jacob does, God is prospering in an incredible way. Finally, it comes time for him to leave after 20 years dwelling with his uncle. It's time for him to leave and go back to his father's house. But remember, Jacob is very fearful. He's afraid of what Esau is going to do if he goes back to his father's house. So on the way back, and him and Laban make a covenant together uh, to not do one another harm. And on the way back, uh, the Bible says in Genesis 32 and 1, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Now we see a growth and a development in the life of Jacob because now Jacob is not just having dreams of angels. Now he has grown in his relationship where now the angels of God are coming to meet him. What once was a dream now becomes reality. Now he's having a supernatural encounter with a host of angels. Now what is happening is he's getting confirmations of the journey that he's on, where he's not just on a journey following some random dream. Now there are a host of confirmations that Jacob is on the right track in his destiny. And as you walk with God, there will be supernatural encounters at youth camps, at services where your pastor preaches, at youth conventions, at camp meetings, men's conferences, ladies' conferences. There will be a host of confirmations. There is a supernatural encounter that comes that is not initiated by you, but that is initiated by God, where God sends the heavenly host to come down where you are and to show you that you are on the right journey. Someone confirms to you that there's something different about you. There's an anointing on you. Have you ever felt the call to preach? Have you ever felt the call to, to sing or do something great from God? And a host of confirmations come that is initiated not by you, but by God himself. And now it's not just a dream anymore. Now we see that God is really wanting to do something in real time in our lives and in our families. He said, this is a place called Mahanaim. It's a Sunday church service where you go down to the altar and you hear the voice of the Lord clearly saying that he is calling you to do something great. And the angels of God come to meet you there as a supernatural encounter, not something that you're going after, but it's where God is chasing after you with his love and with his call. Paul said that I have been apprehended and I am trying to apprehend 
that which is apprehended me is where God gets a hold of you. Come on, Holy Ghost. Where he begins to drive you into the direction that he wants you to go. Empowered by the name of the Lord. I want to talk about that. That process and how God begins to mold you. Gives you a sensitivity to the supernatural as you grow in your relationship. And I remember whenever I first got into the church and how this process started with me. And when I first got into church, I would wear a, I'd have a, a tank top on, Jordan shorts on, Jordan slippers, Jordan socks, Jordan headband. What a Jesus peace medallion. Come on, somebody. Nobody's hearing me out there. I had diamonds in the crown of thorns. And God looked at that boy in his mess, raised in a dysfunctional home, raised in a home filled with domestic violence, emotional, psychological, physical abuse. And in that spot, in that person, in that condition, God looked at me, listen, and he called that person into the ministry. I had nothing to offer God, but God invited me, listen, to come on a journey. Oh Lord. To start a process. And I remember when someone gave me my first suit. It was a navy blue suit. Never wore a suit before. All I had was basketball clothes. And in this suit I, that I had. They gave me also a three-piece suit. With this three-piece suit, it was a brown three-piece suit that they gave me that was had a vest that was made for a bow tie, so the vest came up about this high. I didn't know the difference, and so I was trying to wear a tie under the vest that was made for a bow tie. So this vest is covering my tie, so I would pull it up, and I would walk around with my tie like this. Nobody told me anything. I was wearing a pink shirt. Y'all not hearing me out there. A pink shirt, a brown three-piece suit with a pink and brown tie with black Air Force One. Somebody pray for me right now. Help me, Holy Ghost. Nobody told me nothing. They were probably just looking at me like, hey, don't, don't worry, Victor. He's just, he's just in the process. Black Air Force Ones with white socks. Are you getting it? I was in a process. It was, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just getting in church. I was trying to become what God wanted me to become, but all of a sudden, I started this journey with the Lord. And as I started this journey with the Lord, and I started pursuing this calling, the calling is like on the top of the mountain, and we're at the bottom of the mountain with all this baggage. And I didn't look at the baggage and just get discouraged and say, I can't reach my calling. What I said was, you know what? Let me walk even with all this baggage as I, that I have. As I started walking, pursuing my calling, all of a sudden he began to mold me. He began to say, if you're going to take another step, you need to let down this baggage. So I let down this baggage. And I began to walk toward my calling again. And he said, if you're going to take another step, you're going to have to let go of some friendships, uh, some relationships. I let that go. I started walking. And all of a sudden, the call of God began to sanctify me as I pursued it. God's call will sanctify you in the process as you go after it. He just wants you to go after it. Stop looking at the baggage and say, I can't become, I can't do it. It's not possible. Start walking with all of your baggage and sooner or later, you're going to be so persuaded of what's ahead of you that you're going to start letting some things go. 
Thankfully, in that process, he taught me how to match. <laughs> I realized, hold on, these black Air Force Ones are out of the will of God. I need to put me some brown shoes on with some brown socks, and I started matching. But thankfully, God was patient and long-suffering with me in the process. And on that journey, God gave me a host of confirmations. I reached a place called Mahanaim, as Jacob did, where the angels of God came to meet me in the altar, where there were affirmations and confirmations that I was making the right decisions. And it provoked me to have an experience with God. Everybody has to go to that place, Mahanaim, where you have a supernatural experience, where you can look in the spot and say, that's the spot where God and his host of angels came to touch me and change me. I think about how patient God is with us in the process. When I think about the disciples and how Jesus brought his disciples after he fed the 5,000, he brought his disciples into the ship. And when he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, listen, he put them in a spot that was a constrained spot. He brought them into the ship while a storm was coming on, but he brought them into a controlled environment where they could fail. Listen, folks where they could see their unbelief and doubt, but they, he did it in a controlled environment where nobody else would find out about it. See, some of you want to be exposed too quickly. I'm going to preach to somebody. But God is trying to deal with some things in this process where you don't fail. It's okay to fall when you're in the valley, but if he brings you to the mountain and you fall, you only get one shot on the mountain. You can get up a thousand times in the valley, but you only get one shot on the mountain. He brought them into a controlled environment where he could confront their unbelief, where the multitudes didn't see their weaknesses. I'm preaching to somebody right now. He brought them into a spot where they can encounter their unbelief, but also encounter the revelation of who he was. Notice that God didn't rebuke Peter and call him Satan in front of the multitudes. Because if God would rebuke Peter in front of the multitudes, they wouldn't want to hear what he had to say later on the day of Pentecost. God rebuked Peter in private among a trusted group of people. Come on, somebody. Because God was doing something in him in the process to train him on how to be who he needed to be in the mountain so he could operate in power and not fail, but operate in an anointing. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. You see, even Jesus, no one knew who Jesus was for 30 years. Think about that. 30 years, Jesus is practically hidden. Think about this for a moment. And... The first words when Jesus comes and gets baptized is the father spoke over, over him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hold on one second. Jesus hadn't died for anybody yet. He hadn't opened up a blinded eye. He hadn't unstopped the deaf ear yet. Hadn't healed anybody or anything. Yet the father said, I'm pleased with you. Because my pleasure in you is not determined by your performance. It's determined by your relationship. I'm pleased with you because you didn't try to operate in your gift before it's time. I'm going to talk to somebody on the air. But you, you, don't you understand how tempted Jesus was to abort the process? He's God in the flesh at eight years old. He's God in the flesh from the time he comes out of his mother's womb. And at eight years old, he's listening to the rabbis teach on the Torah, teach on the word. And Jesus could have easily said, actually, that's not what I meant when I wrote that. <laughs> and you have an insecurity issue. I dealt with this with your great-great-grandfather. He was God in the flesh, and he knew, he knew who he was, and he 
was the Word made flesh. They were trying to teach him the Word that he was. Yet you know what Jesus did? He kept his mouth shut and he took notes. He was willing to be silent until silent until his time had come. I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody right now. And, and John saw the dove ascend, descend and abide on Jesus. That was a supernatural experience that let everybody know who was the chosen one. He had a, something initiated by God, something initiated by the Spirit over his life. In this process, God is, is taking out things and he is putting in things. He's taking out the dirt out of your life and he's putting in gold. It's in that ship with those disciples, he shook that ship. Come on. He shook them in that ship until everything that wasn't of God began to come out of them. Until they were empty. And now that they were empty, he began to put gold in them. Put revelation in them. In the process. Jacob, he gets in this process. Then he has a dream of angels. And now he grows in his relationship where he has a supernatural encounter where the angels come to meet. This is all a part of the process. God is molding him. I can't wait to get into the next lesson. This is going to be a turning point, a climax in this series. You don't want to miss this. Looking forward to talking to you about it. God bless.